Welcome to Season 5 of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we talk with enterprise and technology platform leaders about the people, processes, and platforms that make marketing and customer experience successful, scalable, and sustainable. This is what creates an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom advisor and consultant for Fortune 1000 marketing and CX leaders and teams as principal and chief strategist at GK5A and best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and Agile certified coach. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. To sign up for the Agile Brand newsletter and get the latest insights and articles on marketing technology and CX, or to purchase a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, go to gregkillstrom.com. You can also find all my books on Amazon and other retailers. And now on to the show. First, there was the promise of big data solving many of our business challenges, yet now here we are flooded with data. And many businesses are having a hard time knowing what to prioritize and which data to pay attention to. Today, we're going to talk about prioritizing the right data and signals to make a meaningful impact on your business. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Prasanna Daniel, Managing Partner at Grow by Data. Prasanna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. It's such a great honor to be here and, and talk about this topic here. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. So why don't we get started by you uh, giving a little background on yourself and also what Grow by Data does. Sure. So I am a trained engineer and MBA that started in the data space almost like two decades ago. I started, and after undergrad, grad school, I worked in the telecom space you know, and studied a lot of data back in grad school. And this is like in the early days of wireless communication. And, you know, after that experience, I started working in a very early stage healthcare data company that was using, you know, insurance data, you know, pharmacy data to, in fact, create insights to help people, you know, help patients, help hospitals. So that was, that was a very novel, fulfilling type of an experience. I went to business school, you know, and in the early part of last decade, as you noted, everyone was talking about big data big data, you know, and that was the whole movement. And I feel we move from a data scarce society to a big data society. Yeah. And at least, you know, that's what the industry was trying to have us do. And then over the last 10 years, I say that we have evolved to a data overwhelmed society. And uh, what we do, you know, and I started Grow by Data, you know, in the early days of big uh, data nine years ago. And we did this to bring data insights to a lot of small to mid-sized businesses that were going into e-commerce. And we stayed on that you know, for a few years. And then we, we helped companies you know, across verticals, you know, especially in retail, you know, really capitalize and move on Amazon and Walmart, you know, get their products listed on e-commerce. And then you know, with all of that, you know, then questions around intelligence started to come. You know, what, what price should I be selling it? And am I visible? What should my promotions be looking like? And so today, you know, we've evolved to providing insights, marketing insights to large enterprises, mid sized enterprises, you know, agencies on what's share of voice, you know, what's my pricing look like, you know, what's my promotion should be, uh, should be, what are categories that have opportunities, what are geographies where I should go? It's all these types of questions. That's where we've evolved to. And my current thesis, you know, on this topic is, you know, I, I really try to not overwhelm <laughs> clients and listeners with too much. I think we already have too much information. And I feel we have now started to evolve from a data overwhelm society to call it like an, you know, a, a data insight society where you're just getting what you need, you know, without getting too much. So it's, it's an interesting time we're at. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so let's, yeah, let's let's talk about that because I think there there are still some uh, many businesses that are that are facing the conundrum of you know definitely not a lack of of data but too much of it and not not quite to that that insights um, stage. Although you know I I think I agree I think I think we're heading there, but you know with the 
with the overwhelm of, of too much data that, that some companies have, um, you know, it's hard to know where to start, right? So as, as background and uh, you get, you gave a little bit of it as we started, but you know, how, how did we get to this place where, you know, we, we used to be talking about, well, big data is the answer to everything. Now we have too much and, and now we don't know what to do with it. You know, how, how would you describe that, that change? You know, that, that's a, that's a question I've pondered myself, but again, I've, I've, thought, you know, what hap- What seems to happen, you know, in our industry is every five years or 10 years, there's something new, right? You know, that pops uh, and investors are pushing it. The market is pushing it. There's just a lot of dollars that flow into that space, you know, for innovation or, or whatever you want to call it. You know, and then because a lot of marketing dollars flows there, you know, everyone starts to talk about it, right? You know, like media starts to talk about it. You know, companies start to acquire, you know, assets that are aligned with that new capability. Customers start to ask it, you know, and so you you begin to, I, I feel like, you know, you fear or you, you could fall into the trap of fear of missing out, FOMO. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. And so as I think about like big data, right, you know, about 10 years ago, everyone was talking about it. All the data, you know, geeks like us, you know, got super excited, right? You know, and then we wanted our companies to be using, you know, the latest and greatest, you know, there. And, you know, you read the literature, you know, you read the news, you know, that's what was on the news. That was, those were the companies that were going public. Investors were putting dollars into that, right? You know, the press was writing about it. And then, yes, there was, there was merit, you know, like, uh, don't, don't get me wrong. There's huge value, you know, in in using specific aspects of big data. But, you know, companies started to buy it, you know, you started to amass data. You know, you have cloud, you know, and you were, you didn't have the constraint of like buying a server. You could pay as you go, you know, and so you over time started to amass a lot, you know, and then you, you now have this problem of too much data. And now at the moment, as we speak, there's just a lot of talk about generative AI, right, and AI. And, you know, you have... You know, Microsoft and Google, you know, pushing that. You have media talking about it. You have clients, like our clients ask us that question. You know, investors ask that question, you know, and then, you know, if you do not have a handle on that question, if you are not uh, working on that capability or or you don't have a point of view on that capability, you know, you could get left behind. Right. And so, but that doesn't mean like, so So there's there's a few facets here, right? You know, you obviously want to be on top. And you want to be able to have a educated, thoughtful point of view on how to utilize it to add value, but you don't want to overdo it. And so I worry that, you know, in this rush to get the get on the next bandwagon, if you may, you know, you sometimes may not have a thoughtful point of view on the value that it's going to add to your end users. And you might just, and yes, I do understand you want to experiment, but, you know, you might end up getting too much of it. So, you know, like the, the topic about AI, and I'm, this is a very interesting question, Greg, you know, that, you know, we can, we can have a debate about it, right? It's like, okay, I think AI helps us parse through all of this massive data and create insights. You know, I don't need to get a whole page, you know, when I source for like weather in Boston, I don't need to browse through the whole page, you know, on my browser. You know, it's just like, what's the temperature now today? <laughs> That's right, all right. I care for, yeah. you know? So I do think like some of the current techniques are too much. And and that's one pointed use case, but then there are certain use cases where you might want to discover, you know? And, and so I think like really thinking through this a bit more and, and understanding what's what you have at your disposal and how you utilize it allows you to maximize the new items that are coming to your plate without jumping on the bandwagon and realizing like two, three years out that maybe you got too much or you didn't really utilize it well. So, but, you know, long story short, I think, you know, it's like maybe that's what the, how the industry has always operated, you know, every five years or so, five to 10 years, there's something new and the whole industry, you know, everyone from like the investors to wall street to 
media to like the big buyers and conferences and even the big companies, they're trying to sell something new, you know, and so they're pushing and, you know, you may end up getting too much of it. That, yeah. that may be why I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. What do you think, Greg? About that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about AI in a, in a minute as well, but, you know, I, I think that there, there are definitely are every, every so often there is, and probably five years is, is, is about right. You know, there is this, there's a change, there's a major kind of leap forward or just something new that, that comes, comes into being. I think AI is certainly that it's just given the, the, not only the buzz around it, but the actual things that are getting done, like not to go on too, too much of a tangent, but I think there was a lot of buzz around metaverse, but not a lot of action around it. I think with AI, there's, there's a lot of activity and, and real, you know, business opportunity there as, as well. But, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of companies that are certainly they're looking forward to AI, but they're also looking, you know, looking backwards, they made all these investments in, in big data. And so now they're, you know, they're flush with with data. But, you know, to kind of go back to the earlier point, don't really know what to do with it. And, you know, I'm, I guess I just wonder from your perspective, you know, you work with a lot of clients. And I know this from my own work is, you know, every business is a little bit different, but there's also some trends and some, some similarities. Are there any trends or common threads where these organizations that have all this data, you know, where, what's the mindset or what's the, what's the frame of mind they should use as they try to prioritize where to look or what, what data to use or, or possibly even discard? I mean, that's a, that's a fair question. And I'll actually maybe give a example of something that's running in our mind at the moment, you know, so we have collected a huge, you know, we have, you know, a huge amount of data, you know, and it's a diverse set of data you know, that we have, and it's on the cloud, right? And I, I noted that the cloud makes it easy for you to collect and store data because you're, you're paying in pieces versus 10 years ago, you had to buy a server, you know, and manage that 10, 15 years ago. Right. And so, so in my mind, you know, you might have, you might have been amassing years and years of data, right? You might have hundreds of dimensions that you're storing. And, you know, you might have reports, like thousands of reports that are running in your BI applications externally or internally. The question is, what are you using 80% of the time or 90% of the time? And if you closely look, you might realize that you have a lot of outliers. You know, you, you have maybe a subset, you know, of data. So it might be like you're only paying attention to what's happening over the last two years or three years, right? You might only be paying attention to your certain KPIs, you know, and the KPIs have been generated using maybe 20 dimensions out of the thousand you have. And so I think starting to look at, you know, what you are using broadly uh, allows you to see what are outliers. And now I'm sure there will there's going to be folks in your organization that say, oh, yeah, I use that report once every year you know, or once every two years, or there might be one, one person who needs one field, right? And so, you know, I'm making a hard decision and saying, you know, how important is that, right? right Can you right. answer that question in a different way, you know, allows you to decide, you know, how you can trim. And, and that's kind of the same methodology we've used. We've collected all this data and we've, we've just said, you know, we, we're not going to use this. And so it might just be something we stop. But that's that's a framework, and I, I can't be representative. But that's that's a framework that I've seen us and clients use. Now the second part is like you know, okay, what do you really, how do you monetize, right? You know, I, I think you know in terms of monetization, I always find that you know building trends, you know, across time, you know, across industries, across segments is interesting interesting or, or insightful. So for example, if you are working in the apparel space, right, you are Nike, you know, you, you would find consumer insights on shoes as well as what you know, your peers are doing, you know, 
what uh, I call it the top players and the emerging players try to be in insightful because you're trying to learn best practices of your peers and you're trying to learn what the newcomers you know that are winning are doing and so I think that's a great way to monetize data so if you you have a lot of data you know you have external data sets that you buy or are using. So marrying disparate data sets and creating trends uh, on important KPIs for your category or for your geography or for your industry is a way to maximize you know, what, what you've done, I, I think, you know, at the highest level. And your KPI will ob obviously depend on the industry. Right. And then, you know, as I even think forward, I think about like, I always think about four types of analytics, you know, that you can create with data. One is retrospective, what happened, descriptive, why it happened, predictive, you know, if you don't make any changes, here's what's going to happen. And the fourth is prescriptive, which is, you know, if you make this change or if you do something else, here's what, you know, will happen or here's a way that you can prescribe an, an outcome by making these changes. And so I, I always feel like, you know, it's these four questions you're trying to answer, irrespective of technology. You know, whether you're like doing this 20 years ago or whether you're doing it maybe a few years out. And so as I look to the future, I think having access to talent, uh, having access to tools, as well as the mindset to be able to answer these questions quickly, cost-effectively, in an unbiased way will be important. And I mean, I think that's the highest level I can, I can describe. But then, again, based on the industry, in our case, we do a lot of work in digital marketing. We are looking across industries. You know, we do a lot of work in retail. So you might be like, okay, how, is, uh, how should I be pricing my products going into the summer and into like the next holiday season? How much should I be stocking? you know, given the macro conditions. Before we continue, I'd like to introduce you to a sponsor of the show, Partner Hero. Customer service outsourcing has long been available mainly to large enterprise businesses with long-term contracts and onerous procurement processes. Partner Hero is challenging business as usual and bringing the benefits of outsourcing to small and medium businesses as well as startups. With short, flexible contracts and fast ramp up times, Partner Hero is making customer support outsourcing a viable option for small and medium businesses and startups. It's perfect for companies with seasonality expecting a temporary spike in volume or that simply need to scale up. And their focus on quality means your customers will get an experience that feels like it comes from your team. If you're ready to bring in outside customer support help for your company that feels like it's part of your existing team, check out Partner Hero. Head on over to partnerhero.com slash agile, that's partnerhero.com slash A-G-I-L-E, to book a free consultation with their solutions team. Mention you heard about Partner Hero from the Agile brand and the way of the setup fee. Now let's get back to the show. You mentioned um, access to, you know, access to the data and, and everything. And so I wonder there, you know, there's the concept of the citizen data scientist and you know, what, what are your thoughts there with the, you know, with the kinds of, with the companies that you work with? Certainly, I think there's always going to need to be, uh, you know, the traditional data scientists and the, the engineers behind that, that are, you know, connecting data sources and doing all those kinds of things. But, you know, where do you see the, the citizen data scientists in the, in the years ahead? Yeah, that's a, that's a very fascinating topic, Greg. I went to like the Museum of Science, you know, in Boston about two, three weeks ago. And there was a show in the Museum of Science that talked about, you know, ethics and AI and this type of a role. And I thought it was fascinating. I've been thinking about this. And my view is, you know, data in, data out, right? You know, if, you're, if your input data is biased, then your output is going to be biased. Yeah. And so my point of view is, you know, it's really like the ones with the dollar that have generated data, right? If you think about it, right, it's like the largest companies, the, the ones with the most capital, uh, you know, it's individuals, we as consumers with the most amount of capital, it's countries with the most capital, it's, it's uh, sections of the United States 
with the most amount of capital that have devices, you know, that can buy servers, that can buy a cloud, that have generated data, right? I'm, I'm sure, you know, if, if, there, if there is a map of the world that is able to, that is like, imagine like, you know, red as the most dense data and, you know, like faint as the least dense data, I'm sure, you know, you would be able to see where, where data is generated the most. Right. So what does that do, right? I think what that does is, you know, if you're flowing, you know, this data to the algorithms, then obviously the algorithm will be biased. You know, you might, and so, you know, you might have a self-driving car. And the example that I saw in this Museum of Science experiment was, you know, the self-driving cars were biased, you know, so that if you were of a certain skin color, you know, and it was a hazy day, you know, then uh, it was likely for the self-driving car to hit you yeah. versus if you are of a certain skin color. <laughs> you know, so I thought that was fascinating, you know, the way that was portrayed. And so what does that mean, right? You know, it's like, really, it's like, you know, if you have certain data sets that are biasing your model, then your output will be biased. And hence, I think, you know, having a very, uh, you, you call it like a citizen data scientist, it's, I think it's having diversity in thinking. It's, high, it's having folks, you know, again, based on the industry, obviously, you know, making sure that you have people who are underrepresented, you know, in, with a voice on the table, you know, who are in fact pushing back. You know, it's ensuring that you're normalizing your data sets to yeah. the sample, you know, and, and what, I know it's not going to be perfect. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. And hence, you know, a, a wide representation of human individuals or someone who is has that mindset, who's at the at the table, who has a voice, who can even veto, allows models or AI or data science in the future to do a better job and not bias us. That's my point of view, Greg. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and so you know, one one last thing I I wanted to touch on today. Again, we're working with the organizations that that you work with. They may be flooded with data, they may not. But you know, either either way, you know, just wondering: Are there areas where you get a lot of requests, uh, perhaps in in certain areas? But there's are are there areas where companies should be looking that they often don't? You know, or when it comes to data, that many companies may not be really capitalizing on. Do you do you see anything there? Yeah, yeah. So the way I answer that question is, yeah, I have found that, you know, a lot of it's called like dark data, you know, which is sometimes like server logs and you know, usage logs, all of these signals are insightful, correlating these other data sets that might remain in the in your universe of data and correlating that with like the core data in the data warehouses always create something new. So for example, you know, you might marry usage data with something else. That That's one piece. Yeah. The second piece I did want to say is, you know, not all knowledge is codified, right? You know, and so, you know, there is a lot of data in my mind is, is knowledge. And so you, you do have access to data that, you know, your team members have, right? Which may not be structured you know, or stored in a manner that's easily accessible. And so as, as you think about kind of future and kind of how you use data, I would, I would be ensuring, like I would be cataloging all data that I have, you know, like, I mean, hard data, it's worth noting, you know, like, I just came up with like the server logs or usage logs as an example. Yeah. Usage logs generally you use, but like it could be server logs. But then I think I also want to emphasize that there's a lot of, knowledge, you know, that folks have, it could be, you know, it might be on like pictures, you know, on emails, you know, or it could be on social media. Again, these are, these are areas that you, you already have, but it's like also conversations, you know, voice, like podcasts, videos, you know, more and more people are kind of generating these, but as well as like sometimes just having a conversation, you know, with diverse groups within your company, those that are at the forefront, those that are on support and using that creates a new wealth. Because I've always found, you know, like in my experience when I work, you know, my data set says something, but when I have a conversation with a client or someone on the front line or someone like 
the background, you know, I always learn something new. So I think it's balancing that. And, you know, when we talk about data and even I, I may lose sight of that, you know, being a data scientist, I might lose sight that, you know, there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of data that is still embedded in the human brain, you know, that might not have been quantified. I, I think that's, that, that's the way I would think about this, Greg. Right? Yeah. What's your point of view on this? Just curious on this. Yeah, no, I, I agreed agreed with your your points. I mean, I think um, it is hard to kind of reconcile the the easily quantified with the um, more difficult to quantify. So I, you know, definitely, um, it's uh, it's not easy without starting to get into what I would call anecdotal things, which are you know just kind of outsized you know, they have outsized influence on outcomes when, you know, they may or may not be as important. So it's a challenge. I mean, I, you know, certainly I asked the question because I, I'm, I'm also, I'm also searching for, for answers too. I, I think it's, you know, there's, I've worked with organizations to do prioritization exercises of, well, okay, if we could, if we could, you know, cost notwithstanding even, or if we could, you know, regardless of, of what it took to to do something, you know, what would we want to be able to see and what would we want to be able to quantify? And, you know, sometimes some, some interesting things happen when you kind of take the, some of the practicalities or, you know, you stop thinking about how complicated something may be because often also non engineers and non data scientists might think that some things are harder to do than, than they might actually be. So, you know, just kind of taking the, the practicalities out of it for a little bit, just to kind of do a thought experiment, I think can, can often help there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, um, Prasanna, thank you so much for joining the show. Um, one last question before we wrap up, um, you've given a lot of great insights already, but you know, for those businesses that know they need to get smarter in, in the way they're using their data, but maybe not sure where to start, what, what's one piece of advice you'd have for them in the months ahead? I think, for just stating that this is important and making that a charter of the company or slash the goal and letting everyone know that, you know, we are going to be, you know, using data insights to drive decisions, you know, and then that might sound cliche, but just stating that out loud or making like a piece of that, you know, your public charter, you know, increases the importance of that. Second is, I think, you know, it's, you know, again, uh, really understanding what you have, as we discussed, you know, your different types of data sets internally, externally, you know, and cataloging that, creating a diverse team, you know, of data scientists and atypical data scientists, you know, across disciplines, so many even thinking about business models about is, is another one. And then the final thing I do say is there's a lot of, you know, value you can get by on monetizing. So thinking about new business models on monetizing. So traditionally, you know, you might think that, oh, I'm going to increase efficiency by loading it on my BI. Or, you know, if you're a SaaS company, you might be like, oh, I'm going to create, you know, a subscription business. That alone isn't the only business model. There's a lot of business models you can generate by content, right? So you can create benchmarks, you know, you can create you know, impactful reports. And then, so there's a whole business model on content. And then finally, there's new models, you know, that you may be able to generate with service. So you have access to this data and maybe there's a new way that you can offer a service, you know, that reduces time, reduces cost, delights customers. So there's a lot of business model innovation that's also possible. So as you think about kind of you know, maximizing the data possibilities in the in the world ahead i think having a diverse point of view you know and then finally looking at ways that you know you can monetize it to create new business models is what i would encourage you know folks to think about great great well again i'd like to thank uh, prasanna daniel managing partner at grow by data for joining the show you can learn more about prasanna and grow by data by following the links in the show notes Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com 
That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. To get a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, visit my website or you can find it on Amazon or other retailers. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, stay agile.